All right, well, let's stand up. Let's pray. Let's get right the Word of God. And um, so glad that you're able to join us online if you're not able to be here. And we encourage you, obviously, to come. All right, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the Word of God as I come to teach this morning. I make it known that I'm not trusting or depending on limited human abilities to teach, but I am trusting in you, and therefore I know without doubt that you anoint my mind, that I might grasp the revelation that will rise in abundance from my heart within. Thank you now for a supernatural recall of the Scripture. And I believe that your word will flow from my mouth smoothly, accurately, clearly, without hindrance from anything, carried by your anointing, your power and love to each person's mind, bringing understanding and moving confusion, and that you will enter every heart under the sound of my voice, bringing faith, dispelling every fear, and we'll be careful to give you all the praise, your honor and glory for all that's revealed and accomplished through your word and by your spirit here today in Jesus' name. And all those who love the Lord said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Kindly open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. I'm reading out the New King James translation here. And for all of you watching live online as well, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Praise the Lord. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. All right, in verse 10, God says, put on the whole armor. He says, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. We need to understand that that's not saying that we need to go and exercise and get strong or put your shoulders back, be brave. It's talking about us exercising the strength of God, and not depending on our strength, but depending on His strength. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. So this, I allow God's strength, allow God's strength. to work through me. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So, if we are going to walk in the power of His might, the next verse is telling us how to do it. By putting on the whole armor of God. That's how we do it. That we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Say that my problem is not people. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, I know of 12 different occasions that the Lord Jesus appeared to Kenneth E. Hagen, and on one of those occasions, he spoke about this very verse here and discussed these different categories of demonic spirits. And uh, Jesus told Kenneth Hagin that there are four different categories of demonic spirits that we have to deal with while we are here on the earth. And these are the four mentioned. And they are in different ranks and orders of authority in Satan's kingdom. The highest authority is rulers. If you want to write in your Bible, the second is powers, the third is principalities, and the fourth is spiritual hosts of wickedness. Now, a spiritual hosts of wickedness, Jesus said, is also a general term referring to all the rest of the demonic spirits that we have to deal with. All right, let's continue from verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So in order to use the power of God to stand against the demonic forces of, of evil, we must take up the whole armor of God. 14. 
Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Having girded your waist with truth. So the belt that the Roman soldiers wore held the rest of the armor together. And therefore, the waist or the belt of truth is a very important part of the armor of God. Because without truth, nothing works, right? What does it mean then to put on the belt of truth? It means two things. One, that we walk in the truth of the knowledge that we have. Whatever you know about the Bible, walk in the light of that, all right? Secondly, it means if you make a mistake, ask God to forgive you and make sure that you stay in the light of truth. None of us are going to live this life without making mistakes. All right. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the Roman soldiers is the type or the example that Paul's using to describe the arm of God. And he says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. What does that mean? That means know that you have been forgiven for your sins, that you stand righteous in the eyes of God. Because if we have to confront challenges in life or deal with demonic spirits, we are not going to be able to deal with them confidently if we think we are in fellowship with God. And the devil is going to do his best to keep you on the ropes, as it were, by telling you that you made a mistake, you're no good, you don't deserve to exercise authority, you don't qualify, and that's a lie from the devil. He tells all of us the same thing. But we must understand, if we have asked God to forgive us for any mistake, big or small, that we are forgiven. Amen? And we stand righteous in the eyes of God. I'll talk more about that as we go along. And then he says, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Or you might say, making sure that you have your gospel shoes on. So he's talking about the gospel of peace, which means that we need to be ready and available to share with others who don't know the Lord, our testimony, what God's done for us in our salvation, in our everyday life. Talk about your experiences with God. It'll be a witness to the lost. And no one can tell your story better than you, and no one can criticize you or tell you that's not so because it's your own personal experience you're talking about. Amen? They can't argue about that. 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. All right, so the shield of faith stops every attack of the devil. Every attack of the devil. Whatever comes your way, faith will defend you. Amen? And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Well, the helmet of salvation simply means that you know that you are saved because you believe in Christ. If you are a believer in Jesus, you know you are saved. Amen? And the devil will try and talk you out of it. Don't let it. Say this, I believe in Jesus, therefore I'm born again and bound for heaven. See, if the devil can get you to think that you're not saved, then he's going to defeat you. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's our subject this morning. Our message is titled, The Sword of the Spirit. Now, in all the armor of God that we've read thus far, all those weapons are defensive. And this one is the only offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit. Now, no one can go into a fight, no boxer fighting in a championship can fight and win if he doesn't punch, if he's not offensive. Just defending himself will not win the title fight. He has to attack. 
And if you're going to conquer the challenges of life, you are going to have to attack. And we need to attack the demon spirits, attack the force of darkness, and attack the challenges of life. We've got to be offensive as well as defensive. So we're going to be talking about our offensive weapon, the sword of the spirit. This is something that is not discussed very much in Christian circles, our offensive weapon. And so we'll be studying this and uh, making sure that we put our sword to good use. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. In other words, praying in other tongues. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So this is talking about praying in the Spirit as part of the armor of God. Now, I wrote a whole book on verse 18, so I don't want to spend time on it now because I want to focus on the sword of the Spirit. But did we notice in the beginning, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. This is not your armor. This is God's armor. You can wear it. And when you wear God's armor, the devil doesn't know who's coming down the street. He doesn't know if it's Jesus or you. And there's no difference because you're exercising God's abilities. You have the authority to do that. You have the authority to do that. It is the will of the Holy Spirit that we understand the authority that's been given to us by God. In the next scripture we're going to read from Ephesians 1, verse 16, we will see that the Holy Spirit is praying a prayer for you through the Apostle Paul. So that the Holy Spirit is praying for me right here in Ephesians 1, which I'm about to read. Verse 16. I'm choosing the NIV translation here now. Paul says, of course, this is the Holy Spirit speaking, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. All right, he's writing to the church at Ephesus. And if he's writing to the church at Ephesus, he's writing to the church worldwide and all generations. And he says, his prayer is that the Father will give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we'll know God better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. God evidently has given us Eternal riches in our inheritance. Eternal riches in our inheritance. And uh, this began with the resurrection of Christ. It belongs to us now. It's not going to belong to us when we get to heaven and walk the streets of gold. These things were not purchased by the streets of gold. They were purchased at the resurrection of through Christ. They are ours now because we are in Christ. And they will be ours and enjoyable now and in eternity. All right? He wants us to know about the things that Christ purchased for us. If you buy a gift for somebody, don't you want to, them to know what you purchased for them? If you give them a the gift, don't you want them to really use the gift, know what it is and enjoy it? <laughs> Now imagine you gave your life to pay for that gift. Christ gave his life to pay for the gifts that he has given us. And obviously, God wants us to know 
what these wonderful treasures of our inheritance is. Not only that, he also goes on to say, and in verse 19, God's incomparable great power for us who believe. There's no power that can compare with God's power, which is available to us who believe in Him. And God wants us to know about it. That's why He's praying for us. That's why it's in the Bible. Hello. Are you out there, church? And His incomparable great power, which is available to us who are believers. That power is like the working of His mighty strength, which He ex exerted in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places or heavenly realms. So, the power available to us is equal to the power God used to raise Christ from the dead. And that exertion or exercise of power is the greatest exertion or exercise of God's power in all eternity, past, present, and future. And when God created the worlds and the sun and the stars and Adam and Eve, it's not close to the power He released in raising Christ from the dead, because when He did that, not only did He conquer Satan and all demons through that, He also raised every person ever born, ever will be born, and ever was born, all at the same time from death into life. He paid for it there. He paid for our forgiveness. He conquered death, He conquered sickness, He conquered poverty, conquered all our enemies, and gave us total victory all in one moment of time. So we understand what God did for us, and He wants us to know about this power that He released at that time, and He wants us to understand that that's the power that's available to us now, right now. That's what He said. That's in the Bible. We can see here that God wants us to come to a deep spiritual understanding of what our authority on this earth is. This authority can never be understood or enjoyed by simply agreeing with it mentally. Now, I want to say that over a few times. This power that's available to us, which Joshua understood and exercised when he stopped the sun in the sky and the moon without asking God for permission. <laughs> this power and authority is available to us, but it's not going to be enjoyed or even comprehended, understood like it should be or experienced in our lives by mental ascent alone. By just simply listening to this this morning and saying, yes, I can see, Apostle Theo, this is in the Bible, and I can see it's true, that's not going to be enough for us to walk in this. Just agreeing with it, saying, yes, it's in the Bible, I see it, I believe it, that's wonderful. That's mental ascent. It's got to go from here to here before we are going to be able to experience this. And that happens through meditation. It happens through meditation. Not five minutes, but daily. Spending time, some time, thinking about these things. Reading the Scriptures along this line taking your notes, taking this message and thinking about the scriptures that I'm giving you, meditating on them daily. It'll take a few months and you'll start to see that when you speak, things happen. Things change. You'll start to see circumstances line up and demons flee, angels got to work. You'll start seeing things change in your life. I'll say it again, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen just by knowing it's so in your head. It doesn't happen by just saying, I agree, it's in the Bible, 
That's not going to make it work. God said to Joshua, in Joshua 1, 8, Meditate on my word day and night, that you may do according to all that's written in it. And then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Joshua, I'm giving you the principle, the formula, and you will make your own way successful. I'm not going to do it for you, Joshua. You'll do it for yourself. Here are the tools. Go to work. God didn't build the ark for Noah. He gave him the tools. He said, go ahead and do it. We have got to build this ark with our faith. Meditate in the Word, and then you'll become, you can walk in it like Joshua. If Joshua's able to do it, in the Old Covenant, without all the promises and scriptures we've got in the New, without the blood of Jesus shed for us on the cross, if He could do it in the Old Covenant, surely we can do at least that in the New, right? And um, so, now you can just think about this. Just think about this. You got the earth spinning, going to, uh, around uh, 24 hours, going around, and you got going around the sun. You got the earth, moon going around the earth, and all this going around this this great orbit. And Joshua just spoke, and it stopped. The animals didn't fall over. The warriors fighting in the battlefield didn't fall over. They didn't even know it happened. The birds didn't stop flying. I mean, imagine you going a thousand miles an hour and you hit a wall. You would recognize it, surely. You know, something just happened. I hit a wall, I think. Right? <laughs> Can you confirm that? <laughs> no. Okay, so, but no one even knew. God is that amazing, right? That amazing. And you would think if gravity stops, everything would float off into space. Nothing like that happened. And God didn't have to call a meeting. Jesus, come quickly. Holy Ghost, come quickly. Angels, come quickly. Let's huddle. Let's talk about this. Because Joshua has just put us on the spot here. What are we going to do about this? We, we, I, I wasn't prepared for this. Are you ready for this? No, I'm not ready for this. Okay, none of that happened. Bang, Joshua spoke, there it was. Imagine that. So the point I'm trying to make here is there's no limit to the authority you can use. There's no limit. You don't have to stop and think, well, is this too much for God? Right? But we're not going to walk in all of that until we meditate on this and get this in our heart. There's going to come a joy in your heart, an excitement. You know, I've got this. I can do this. I can walk in this authority. Your senses will tell you it's impossible, but you'll ignore that because you'll know inside, I can do this. By the authority of Christ, this will work. Amen? So whether you realize it or not, there are hostile spirits all around you trying to frustrate you and destroy you at every opportunity. Everything you are assigned to do for God, both at work or in the church, the devil will frustrate you and stop you if he can. Everything you want to do in your fellowship time with God at home, the devil will frustrate you. He'll do everything he can to stop you reading your Bible He'll do everything he can to stop you praying. He'll do everything he can to stop you from witnessing. He'll try and frustrate your relationship with your wife. He'll try and frustrate your relationship with your children. He'll try and frustrate your relationship with your boss and your co-workers. He'll try and frustrate your relationship with the people you go to church with. He'll try everything to divide and conquer and frustrate everything in your life. And this is not an accident. It's demonic spirits at work. And we must recognize that the devil will try and frustrate you in every turn. And nothing's going to try. No, he won't. He hates this message more than any other message. I'll tell you right now. And he comes to steal the word. Mark chapter 4. 
Mark chapter 4, verse 15, it comes and takes the word out of the heart. When you hear the word, it comes immediately. That means right now, while you're hearing the word, it comes immediately, takes the word out the heart. He'll try and distract you, try and make you think of something else. Our fight of faith is to put the word in the heart because that's what brings faith. And his fight against our fight of faith is to take the word out of the heart. Because once the word goes in, if we walk in faith, we can overcome him every time. Beat him every time. If we will hold the devil in the arena of faith, we'll always be victorious. But if we keep, if we go into the realm of reason, he'll defeat us every time. We cannot go into the realm of reason and beat the devil. We've got to stay in the realm of faith, which means the word. No matter what circumstances happen, we can't think about it, ignore it. Go to the word and say, the word says, and speak that. And you know what's in the heart because Jesus said it'll come out the mouth. What's in the heart will come out the mouth. Right? Mark 11, 23. Whosoever will say unto this mountain, be not, and uh, 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 say, be removed, be cast in the sea, and don't doubt in your heart, but whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed, and cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things he says will come to pass, he'll have whatever he says. All right, so Jesus said, you have whatever you say if you believe in the heart. Doubt not in your heart. He didn't say anything about the mind. So you can have thoughts of doubt come into your head all the time. The devil will try and put you thoughts of doubt in the head, and get you to reason and think. Don't. How do you know you're in faith? How do you know? Because your words will determine what's in your heart. So listen to your words. Always keep your words in the present tense or past tense. Not the future. Not the future. Always keep your words in the present or past tense. I have it now. It has been done. I received it. Praise God. Not going to get it. That's hope. All right? Once you prayed or confessed, call those things that be not as though they were. You got it? So keep him in the realm of the word and you will hold him in his place. You'll keep him defeated. But if you'll start reasoning about these things, and thinking about it, give it too much thought, you're going to lose the battle. Stay out of the mind. Stay in the heart. And you'll know, if you're in what, you'll know what you believe in by listening to your words. Listen to your words all the time. Am I speaking words of faith? Am I speaking positively? Even if your head says you don't believe it, it doesn't matter. Say it. Eventually you will believe it. If you say it enough, you'll believe it. If you say it enough, you will believe it. Because your words will program your heart. And then your heart will speak faith. All right? You'll hold the devil and defeat him. So if we fail to understand our authority over these forces of darkness, we will be overcome and we will be defeated continually. The devil doesn't want Christians to learn about their authority. He wants to maintain control over the believer. He wants to keep Christians in a state of continual defeat. He doesn't want Christians to have dominion over him. That's why he doesn't want us to know about this. Our authority belongs to us whether we realize it or not. It's almost as bad as a poor sinner out there who doesn't know God has forgiven him and canceled his debt, so he goes to hell for nothing. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, God said, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. God has forgiven the entire human race of our sin through Christ. Every person is forgiven. The lost are forgiven. We are forgiven. But they don't know it. When they, when they accept Christ... They enter into what's paid for. If we make a mistake, 
Understand, we don't have to beg God to forgive us. He has already. You are forgiven. Go to the bank of forgiveness and make a withdrawal. Say, Father, I receive my forgiveness. I repent. I receive my forgiveness from the bank of forgiveness. You have forgiven me. I accept it. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God has reconciled the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So God is sending out the church with this message. Go and tell the world they are forgiven. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that, we, that in Him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. So Christ became the sum total of all sin on our behalf, on the cross, took all sin of the human race, and God punished Him for it, and God gave us His own righteousness. It says here, so that in Him, Christ, you might become the righteousness of God. So all those who are in Christ have received God's righteousness. Now, it would be great if we had the righteousness of an angel, but we have more than that. We have God's own righteousness, which means, therefore, we are as righteous as God is. So that I am as righteous as God is by God's grace. Thank you, God. Therefore... I can stand in the presence of my Father now without guilt, shame, inferiority, complexes, or guilt. I am forgiven, washed by the blood of Jesus and the grace of God. And I praise you, Father, for what you've done for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't the devil talk you out of it. Therefore, if we do not understand what God has done for us, it can't help us. That sinner out there doesn't know what God's done for him, so he goes to hell unnecessarily. It's totally not necessary. And likewise, the believer can't operate in the authority of Christ because he doesn't understand what God's done for him. He doesn't understand it doesn't know about it. What is the authority? What is the sword of the Spirit? Authority is delegated power. I've used this example before. And many other preachers have used it too. Of the policeman that holds up his hand in the middle of the traffic and the driver will stop his car because he knows Behind that policeman is the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, uh, the police force, and the whole government. So he better stop. And he does. So a man's authority is only as good as the amount of power supporting him, behind him. Right? Someone's authority is only as good as the power behind him. So what kind of authority do you and I have in the spirit realm? Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, I give you authority so that Jesus himself has given me my authority. I give you authority to trample on serpents, on snakes and scorpions, types of and examples of demons. And to trample on overall and, and to overcome all the power of the enemy, and nothing will buy and nothing will harm you. So he said, I've given you authority over all demonic spirits. <coughs> over all the power of the devil, and nothing will harm you. Now, did Jesus exaggerate when he said nothing will harm you? No. Or did he lie? No. Or is that just 
A figment of speech, perhaps. Or does he really mean nothing will harm you? What he's saying is, if we'll walk in this authority, nothing will be able to harm us. If it's conditional. If we'll walk in this authority, nothing will be able to harm us. So if anything harms us, we must understand it's not the will of God. He wants us to take our authority and deal with it. And God is not going to chase the devil for you. Don't ask God to do that. Don't ask God to chase the devil. He's not going to. God's done everything about the devil he's ever going to do until he throws him in the pit for a thousand years during the millennium reign of Christ. No, God's given us authority over the devil. James 4, 7, you resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Right? Amen. So God, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, and all the angels are behind you. When you use the name of Jesus, that's the power behind you. That's the authority you have. All right? The policeman has the natural power of the government of the United States, but we have the creator of all things, And Jesus Christ, the Father God, the Holy Ghost, and all the angels behind us in the realm of the Spirit. Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Now we understand what the power of His might is. God is saying, be bold to use my power. This means you can stop the devil, put up your hand, and he will stop. In the name of Jesus. Stop the circumstances in the name of Jesus. Now, unfortunately, as I said, most Christians don't understand, don't realize that the attacks are coming from the devil. They don't realize problems are coming from the devil to steal the word. To steal the word. Say this, problems come in my life to steal the word. To stop me going to church Reading my Bible, getting in the Word. That's why problems come. They don't realize all problems are coming from the devil for the purpose of seeing the Word. Unless, of course, we make stupid decisions or sow bad seed. All right, number two. Folks don't know how to resist him with their God-given authority. They don't know how. They don't know how. Okay, so they might find out, yes, I've got this authority, but how do I use it? It's like a child being given a gun. He might have a gun, but he doesn't know how to use it. Or somebody's not trained to use a weapon, can't help them then, right? Now, I'm going to share a story with you today that I've shared before. Some of you may hear it, may know it, and some may not. But this story, in particular, I'm going to share with you how to exercise your authority in natural circumstances of life. You will see how to exercise authority over demon spirits that will change natural circumstances. You'll see the correct way to do it and the effect. And this will work for you exactly the same that it worked for me. All right? Watch this. Okay? Going back to 1998, that's 23 years ago, Pastor Bev and I came to the United States. I was speaking. I came two or three times a year to America, speaking in various places. And I was coming to speak, and I, Pastor Bev wanted to visit his sister Brenda, with her husband, George, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, for a few days. And so before we left South Africa, Natalie and Candace, who were 15 and 13 at the time, were talking to George Jr. and Robert on the phone, their cousins, the same ages. 
And they were going to take them fishing in a little stream behind the house. And so they were planning this event and got all excited about it. When we arrived at Brenda's house, um, the kids were in the living room the next morning after arriving, and they were, the boys were showing them all the, 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 the equipment that they were going to be using to go fishing with and how to use it. And they were getting ready. And I decided to go and pray in the room we were sleeping in. And so I went back there and I put my uh, knees on the floor, my elbows on the bed, and I began to pray in the Spirit, in other tongues. And um, I've been praying for about half an hour when all of a sudden an unction of the Holy Spirit came. What do I mean by that? Well, I suddenly began to pray fervently, effortlessly, effortlessly. By the ability of the Holy Spirit rising up in me, I prayed out loud, fervently. Imagine rowing across a lake that's calm in the morning, a beautiful lake, and all of a sudden, a gentle breeze comes up and blows in your sails. <laughs> and you start going along the lake effortlessly. You put your oars in the boat, and you're enjoying the scenery. That's what it's like. The Holy Ghost came and just blew inside of me, and I just began to pray with His ability. And uh, I was praying like that for a while, and I began to really grow in the Spirit. When all, I looked into my heart and said, Holy Ghost, what's going on here? I knew that this unction was for a purpose. So I looked into my heart, what I mean by that is I began to focus my attention on my spirit. I said, Holy Spirit, what's going on here? And so, just as I said that, I knew immediately, I'm praying for Natalie. The devil wants to kill her. She's about to die. I knew that. So I got up from my knees. I went to the lounge, the living room, and I saw the kids there getting ready, laughing, having fun, all happy. And I knew I had to go with them fishing. And then my reason got in the way. And I said, they're all happy. They're all great. Natalie's not in danger. I don't have to go. I don't want to rain on their parade. They don't want Dad dragged along with them. And um, I just imagined that. I just imagined that. And I reasoned myself out of what I experienced what the Lord said. The Bible said, trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your understanding, right? So when God speaks, always instantly obey the voice of your spirit. Otherwise, he'll talk you out of it. The devil will. Now, when you cross the street, you use your eyes and your understanding. But in the things of the spirit, trust in your heart. So, I went back to prayer, and I prayed a while, and then this unction came again. I began to pray fervently. I looked in my heart, and the same thing happened. Natalie's going to die. Go with him. So I went to the lounge, and they were all having fun. Everything's so good. And Natalie looks safe. I said, they, they're not in danger. They're going to fish a little stream behind the house here. Everything's fine. I talked myself out of it the second time. Went back to praying. I came back the third time, they were gone. Anyway, I said to George, take me to the gym. And he took me around the corner, five minutes drive, three minutes drive, to the gym. I said, pick me up in an hour. So he did, and or he, we arranged that. I paid my fee for the workout, and there's a guy behind the counter, a young man in his early 20s, reading a book. It's about a four-foot-high counter. All I could see was the top of his head. No one else in the gym, and the music was so loud, you could hardly think straight, which is good for me. Anyway, I started working out, and suddenly this burden came. I felt lost. I felt sad. I felt depressed. I felt lonely. I felt deaf, like somebody had died. The same thing that happened while I was praying, this experience happened to me here again. I felt this, I sensed this in my heart, sadness, loss, depression. 
I was fine. There's nothing wrong with me. All of a sudden, I feel like this. I said, Holy Spirit, what is it? And I knew again, this is Natalie's going to die. Now, you see what the Holy Spirit does. Whatever tragedy is ahead, He will give you that experience in your heart as if the tragedy happened. So, now, if Natalie had died, the grief that I would experience, I was now experiencing before it happened. So, He's trying to get me to avoid it by praying and stopping it. But evidently, I hadn't succeeded as yet, even though I prayed in the Spirit for over an hour while I was down there on my knees in the bedroom. I hadn't solved the problem yet. So I'm praying fervently now. Now, this is the part I want you to see. This is the part I want you to see. So I'm praying fervently now in the Spirit. I'm praying, I'm not shouting out loud, but I'm praying loud enough to where I can hear it over the music, but he can't. And I'm, I'm just walking around. I'm making like I'm working out. I'm not working out now. And now the Holy Spirit starts talking to me, starts speaking to me. Take authority. Now he's leading me. He's guiding me. Take authority over these demons that are trying to hurt your daughter, Natalie. So I knew, all right, I must bind the devil and demons. So I spoke out loud. I said, Satan, and you demons, you want to hurt my daughter? You want to kill her, take her life? I demand by the authority of Jesus Christ in his name that you do not hurt Natalie. I bind you in Jesus' name. You shall not hurt Natalie. She'll live or not die. And I spoke that out aloud, aggressively. What am I doing? I'm using the sword of the Spirit. You got it? All right. Now, if I did not use the sword, Natalie would be dead. So, I bound the devil. And then I carry on praying in tongues, and I sense the Spirit of God leading me again. He's saying, now I release the angels to protect her. So I said, angels of God, I release you now. Go and protect Natalie, according to Psalm 91, Psalm 37. I want you to protect Natalie in the name of Jesus. I thank you. And I began to pray in tongues again, praying out loud, praying out loud. The Holy Ghost still leading me, unctioning me. I still sense that burden to pray, praying, 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 praying. See, the Holy Ghost is praying for Natalie. He's praying for the situation that's about to come. He's praying through me for Natalie for that situation so that he can take charge of it. So the Holy Ghost can arrest it. So he can act in that circumstance. And then he leaves me again. Go back to exercising your authority. He says, now I sense in my heart, don't bind him again. Because once he's bound, he's really bound. You can't unbind him and rebind him. And bind. If you do that, if I bind him every five minutes, that means I had no faith in the first, bind, first binding. Somehow he got loose. So I said, Satan, I want to remind you, I believe you are bound. You may not and you cannot hurt my daughter in the name of Jesus because I have bound you. You are bound. So I'm doing. I'm saying it for my benefit really, right? So that's what he wants me to say. And then he says, now I'll speak to those angels again. So I said, angels, thank you. Thank you for protecting my daughter in the name of Jesus. And I can't pray in tongues. So I went through this for about an hour, and as I prayed like that, I sensed this grief, sadness subsiding, and I sensed joy start rising in my heart. I got to a place where I felt like singing and praising God. So I knew I had the victory. So George came. I said, George, take me quickly now to the place where they're fishing. We couldn't get in. There's too many reeds there. They're 40 feet, 30 feet high three, four inches thick. You can't even put your hand in between. We walked 500 yards that way, 500 yards that way. We couldn't find the stream. Just then, the phone rang in the house. It was the police station. Pastor Bev arrived then with uh, Brenda. 
And the police said, we've got your kids here. Come on over. So we came over. Natalie's sitting there in George's T-shirt. In those days, they used to wear long T-shirts down their knees for some reason. And um, so she's sitting there, and, and, and she's not wearing her clothes. She's wearing George's T-shirt, and George has got no T-shirt on. Um, George Jr. So um, I said, Natalie, what happened? She looked frazzled. I said, what happened to you? She said, well, we were sitting there on the bank fishing, and a voice spoke from behind us saying, show me your fishing license. And uh, so George Jr., 15 years old, said, we don't need a fishing license. We are not 16 years old. So he said, I'm an inspector. You do need a license. Come up here. So he called him out from the bank up into this clearing, which is about as big as this platform. And then uh, there was no one there. They got up. There's no one there. Then he came out behind some bushes. And he's about six foot two in his early 20s, uh, very well built. He had no clothes on his body at all, zero clothes on his body. And he had a T-shirt wrapped around his head, just his eyes sticking out. And Natalie stepped forward and put out her hands to protect the other kids. She's very protective, always been that way. She wanted to protect her little sister. And she stepped out to protect the other kids. And she heard the feet running. And she turned around, couldn't see which way they went. There's three exits, three pathways to the reeds. And it's about 200 yards long, those pathways. And she did not know which one they took, but she's looking that way to see. And this guy must have cleared five paces and got behind her, ripped her dress off with one swoop, threw her on the ground, got on top of her, was proceeding to rape her. Now, here's the thing. Natalie had two options. One, she could try and wrestle this guy and fight him off with her own strength. A 15-year-old girl weighing 115 pounds probably at the time, a 215, 220-pound man, in the prime of his life, fit and strong, aggressive. There's no way she's going to fight him and beat him. There's no way. And there's no one for miles around, and you can't even get there if you try it. So the Holy Ghost is telling me my daughter would have died. But... The Holy Spirit had worked through me and made me exercise authority in that situation with the sword of the Spirit and praying in the Spirit. Now he is able to work, right? So what is the alternative? That Natalie would exercise spiritual authority and not even try and fight this in the natural. Now that's unlikely that any person in that situation would exercise spiritual authority instead of physical authority, a spiritual physical fighting. It's natural for somebody to fight back, but you didn't even think about that. Now, this is no super saint. Let me tell you now, Natalie and Candace were not super saints. They were not living for God as they should have been. Not like they are now, nowhere near it. And yet, and yet, the Holy Ghost was able to seize that moment and put Natalie on like a glove and she spoke out and shouted at this man's face and said, Satan, I bind you in the name of Jesus. And when she screamed that into his face, he jumped up dazed and she ran off, took one of those pathways and ran, thinking he's behind her, ran for her life, got out to the clearing in a soccer field, and there were the three little kids standing. They didn't know whether they were going to get the police or stay there, and they stayed. She came out, and George Jr. gave her her T-shirt. I'm fully persuaded that Natalie would not be with us today if the Holy Ghost did not warn me, and I did not use my authority. So notice this, we dealt with the spiritual realm, 
that affected the natural realm. Our warfare is not against flesh and blood. Our warfare is against the demonic spirits. You have people that dislike you, say things about you, try and hurt you. Don't even bother with them. Talk to the demons. You have people that owe you money and that they have hurt you and does stuff to you. Talk to the demons. Release your property. We are in a world right now where the spirit of Antichrist is trying to oppress the church, silence the church, divide the church, keep us at home, afraid to go out. This is not God. This is not God. We have to understand these are demons, spirits at work, coming against the church. That's what this is about. And we have got to exercise authority and push back the forces of darkness and get our freedoms back. Listen to me, church. It's not in the hands of the politicians. It's not in the hands of the Air Force, the Navy, the Army. It's in the hands of the church whether we survive or defeated. And we are not going to be defeated. Jesus is coming back for a glorious church and it's time for the glorious church to rise up and take its place in this hour. In this hour. So we're going to talk about the sword of the Spirit and we're going to release it. We are going to release it. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Give the Lord some praise in the house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God.